for part two. Today we are going to talk all about the atom. We left off last time talking about the periodic table and we learned that it used to be arranged by uh, Dmitri Mendeleev by increasing atomic mass, but it's now arranged by increasing atomic number. And the atomic number will tell us a lot about the atom. And so today we're going to um, start looking at the structure of the atom and the history of the atom and all kinds of good stuff. So all of the elements that are listed on the periodic table are made up of atoms. We say that atoms are the building blocks of matter. Atoms are the smallest particles of an element. So we're going to spend some time learning about them. So one of the first people to really think about the atom was John Dalton. And essentially his, you know, his thought was if we say take a piece of paper and we tear it in half, and then we tear it in half again, we tear it in half again. Is there a point at which we can't, you know, tear it up anymore? Is there a piece of matter that is so small that it is indivisible? Okay, and so he was the first person to really think about, hey, there's got to be something really, really tiny that we can't, you know, tear in half anymore. Um, and he proposed this atomic theory that atoms were responsible for the combinations of the elements in compounds. Okay. Um, and he had four different postulates of his atomic theory. And the first one is that all matter is made of these tiny particles that are called atoms. The word atoms comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. So that's where we get this word atom from. And he said that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another and different from atoms of other elements. This is actually not true anymore. Um, it's kind of true, but not completely true. And we're going to learn about why this isn't true. And when you look at this later, I want you to think about isotopes. Okay. The third postulate says that atoms of two or more different elements combine to form compounds. And a particular compound is always made up of the same kinds of atoms and the same number of each kind of atom. So let's think about this like water. Water is always made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, always, right? And so that's when it's saying a particular compound is always made up of the same kinds of atoms, right? Um, this is always water. You can't change the number of hydrogens and oxygens in it, or then it's not water anymore. And then lastly, um, his fourth postulate was that a chemical reaction involves the rearrangement, separation, or combination of atoms. Atoms are never created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. And again, that one's true. We have to obey the law of conservation of matter, right? We will talk about this a lot in this class. Conservation, there we go. Um, atoms cannot be created or destroyed. They can just be rearranged in these chemical reactions. So this was one of the first, you know, times that people really thought about the atom. It was a really good starting point. Not completely true, like we were talking about, but it was a really, really good starting point. So atoms are the building blocks of everything around us. Everything in the entire world, the entire universe is made up of atoms. They are too small to see with the naked eye. Um, this here, this, these are gold atoms, and you can use what's called a scanning electron microscope to get really, 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 you know, tiny images of atoms, which are cool. We do not have one at COS. Um, we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> so, um, but this is, it's really, really cool. Um, but we can actually scan and see these individual atoms if we, you know, if we wanted to. So at the end of the 1880s, we had some more experiments um, with electricity that showed that the atom was not actually the smallest thing out there. Um, there were these things called subatomic particles, sub meaning smaller, right? And atomic referring to the atom. So subatomic particles means things that are smaller than the atom, things that are, you know, the atom is actually made up of stuff. And so the atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it was shown that some of these subatomic particles actually have a charge. So we're going to go through and talk about um, some of these experiments that led to these discoveries. Not all of them, but we're going to talk about some of them. 
So one of the experiments was an experiment done by J.J. Thompson, and he discovered these cathode rays. So he used cathode rays, and he saw that these cathode rays were streams of small, negatively charged particles, and he called them electrons. Okay, And he came up with this plum pudding model of the atom. So I'm going to talk, let's see, so this, this is my beautiful drawing of what John Dalton thought the atom would look like. He thought the atom was just this small, solid sphere, and that there was nothing smaller than the atom. It was this tiny, hard particle that everything was made out of, but there was nothing smaller than the atom. But J.J. Thompson discovered these tiny, negatively charged particles called electrons, and he proposed this plum pudding model over here. Um, and his plum pudding model said, okay, well, there are these little negative electrons that have to go in the atom. And so I'm just going to kind of spread them out here in the atom every so often. And we know that the atom is neutral. So if there's these negatively charged pieces, then there's got to be something that's positively charged. And he didn't know about protons yet. So he said, okay, we're going to spread out these little negatively charged, you know, pudding or plums and the pudding, the rest of it is going to be positively charged so that the atom is still neutral. So we've got little negative pieces and then the positive pudding. You could also think about this as like a chocolate chip cookie model. Um, since, you know, we're not British, we don't eat plum pudding, right? The, you know, electrons would be like the chips and the cookie part would be, you know, this positive, the positive pudding part, okay? Um, and then flash forward a little bit later, we have Ernest Rutherford and he's my favorite. He, he, um, did he just, sorry, he's credited with discovering the nucleus essentially. Um, but he worked with JJ Thompson and he said, okay, we're going to do this experiment. And if what you say is true, if your plum pudding model is true, then I'm going to shoot this beam of positively charged particles like this, right? All these little positively charged particles. And we're going to sh shoot them at this piece of gold foil. And what's going to happen is that they are all going to go straight through and they're going to hit the back of this detector here. So we have the gold foil, we have this detector, and the detector is going to detect where these positively charged particles hit. And so Rutherford predicted that most of them were going to go straight through. Maybe some of them would go off like little weird angles, but most of them should go straight through. And what he found is that, yes, most of them went straight through, but some of them got deflected like a lot like this and some of them got really far deflected like they were hitting something and he said okay you know there must be something in there these particles must be hitting something that's causing them to bounce back like this um he's saying you know if it if it you know we shoot it and then it hits something and it's bouncing like what like what is this right he said, based on J.J. Thompson's model, there's nothing There's nothing in there that it should be hitting. And even if it hit the electrons, right, the electrons are really, really small. And if it did hit an electron and say, you know, it interacted with it, we're shooting positively charged stuff and electrons are negatively charged. Positives and negatives attract. So even if it was hitting an electron, it should stick to it or something. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing in there that it should be bouncing off of. So the plum pudding model must not be true because there's nothing in there for it to bounce off of. So he said, okay, there must be something in the middle of the atom that is, you know, really hard, um, dense, and positively charged. And he said, okay, this hard, dense, positively charged thing, we're going to call this a nucleus. There is something in the middle right in the middle of this atom that is hard, it's dense, and it's positively charged, we're going to call it a nucleus. So he's like, sorry, J.J. Thompson, your plum pudding model must not be correct. It can't look like that. Instead, it's got to have something hard and positively charged in the middle. And we'll let your electrons, you know, be zooming around the outside. Okay. So from the gold foil experiments, he figured out that there was a small region in the middle, right? that's called the nucleus. It is hard, dense, and positively charged. And he said most of the atom must be empty space because most of the, um, most of the alpha particles went straight through 
they weren't hitting anything, they didn't, you know, stick to anything, so it must be mostly empty space. And, and the electrons must be out there somewhere, right? But they can just hang out kind of in this empty space, zooming around, doing their own thing. So the middle is called the nucleus, and then this region outside the nucleus, uh, like everything else, this is going to be called the electron cloud. Okay, um, and the reason that um, I like Rutherford so much is that when he was doing this experiment, and like I said, he thought all of these alpha particles were going to go straight through. And he said that when some of them bounced off, he was so shocked, it was like a howitzer shell bouncing off of a tissue. And so me, I had to go look up what a howitzer shell is, because I don't know. Um, but essentially what it was is that, you know, if you took a gun and pointed it at a tissue paper and shot it, and then the bullet bounced off, that's what's shocking, right? It'd be like if the bullet bounced off of the tissue paper, that would be crazy, right? And so I like him because, you know, because he explained it that way. That was how shocking this experiment was, though. The bullet bounced off the tissue paper. The, you know, the, the alpha particles bounced off the gold foil. That's what's crazy. So he called, um, back to, you know, back to chemistry, um, he called those positively charged particles protons and the negatively charged particles electrons. And since the atom must be neutral, the protons are going to equal the electrons, but more on that later. Atoms are really tiny, right? We've talked about that before. Atoms are really, really small. We can't see them with the naked eye. But if the atom were the size of a football stadium, then the nucleus would be the size of a golf ball in the center of the field, right? So that's crazy. The nucleus is really, really, really small compared to the atom and the atom is really small anyways. And remember, in that nucleus, we have a bunch of little tiny protons. So the protons are really, really small. So it's just kind of crazy to think about. There is, um, on Canvas, there is a video that you can watch, and it says, just how small is an atom? And it's one of those things that our brain can't really process just how small the atom is. So I would recommend going and watching this video. It's really interesting just to try and give yourself some perspective of not only how small an atom is, but how small the nucleus must be. It's really crazy. So here's our atom, right? Our atom is composed of two regions, like I said. One of them is the nucleus. That's gonna be that positively charged stuff in the middle. And um, the electron cloud is going to be around the outside. The nucleus contains the mass of the atom. Okay, the nucleus is going to contain the protons and the neutrons. That's gonna be where all of the mass of the atom is. And the electron cloud is going to be the region that surrounds the nucleus. This contains most of the space of the atom. Because remember, I told you the nucleus is really dense, right? It doesn't contain much space. The electron cloud is going to be where all of the space is coming from. So when you think about nucleus, I want you to think about the mass, right? That's where the protons and the neutrons are. And the electron cloud is going to be all of the space where the electrons are. Okay, so like I said, what's in the nucleus? We have two of the three subatomic particles, two of the three particles that are smaller than the atom. The first one is the protons. Those are positively charged particles and the neutrons are neutrally charged particles. That third subatomic particle is outside the nucleus in that electron cloud, and that is the electron. That is the one with negative charge and essentially no mass. And the reason that we're gonna treat electrons like they have no mass is because they are so, so small. Like protons and neutrons are really small, but electrons are really, really small. Um, and you can think about electrons being like the hairs on your head. If you, you know, if you lost a couple hairs on your head, then your mass isn't going to change, right? When you step on the scale, it's still going to say the same weight, even though you lost a couple, you know, a couple hairs. That's why we treat electrons like they have no mass is because they're kind of like the hairs on your head. If you gain them or lose them, then the mass doesn't really change just because they are so, so small. Okay. How do these particles interact? The protons and the neutrons exist in the tiny, compact 
positively charged nucleus, right? And again, that's going to be most of the mass of the atom. And the negatively charged electrons are small, but they have, um, they occupy a lot of space outside the nucleus. They have a really small mass, but occupy a lot of space. Um, chemists will talk about the mass of the, of the atom in this unit called AMU, which stands for atomic mass unit. So we don't talk about the mass of the atom in grams because the atom is so, so small, right? It wouldn't make any sense. We measure stuff in the lab in grams. We can't measure the atom in grams. So instead, we measure it in AMUs. And when we measure things in AMUs, we're going to assign protons and neutrons a mass of essentially one. We're going to treat them, we're going to just round these to whole numbers. We're going to treat them like they have a mass of one. Um, and they're essentially the same, right? Protons and neutrons, 1.007 and 1.008. Um, and so for our calculations, we just round it to do one. And then again, if you look at electrons, see how small that mass is? especially compared to the, you know, to the other protons and the neutrons. Um, so we treat electrons like they have a mass of zero. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and we have abbreviations for all of these things. So instead of always having to write out protons, neutrons, electrons, we can write out P plus, N zero, and E minus. So in your notes, if you're trying to look for some shorthand, that would be the way to go. P plus, N zero, E minus. And this up here, this is the charge, right? P is for proton, and the plus is because it's positively charged. N is for neutron, and the zero because it's neutral. E is for electron, and then minus because it's negative. Um, and then uh, off to the right, it just tells you where it is. Nucleus for the protons and the neutrons. And outside the nucleus, in that electron cloud um, for the electrons. So again, here's that video I was talking about before. You know, it says how small the electron is, or sorry, how small the atom is. It's really, really interesting video, and it just kind of gives you some perspective. All right, on to kind of the meat of the of the lecture, the atomic number. So we talked about the atomic number in our lecture on the periodic table, and the atomic number is always going to be this number at the top, and this will tell you the number of protons in the atom, and remember. We were talking about that periodic table. The periodic table is not arranged in order of increasing atomic mass anymore. It's arranged in order of increasing atomic number. It's arranged by the number of protons. So you'll notice that it goes in order of this number. The mass is often on the bottom down here, um, and, it, and that is not always in order. Like we looked at um, argon versus potassium and cobalt versus nickel some of them will be out of order. So it's not arranged by mass anymore, it's arranged by the number of protons. And again, it's always going to be above the symbol of the element. So how do we know the number of subatomic particles in the atom? The atomic number, that number at the top we were just looking at, will tell you the number of protons in the atom. So like hydrogen is atomic number one, so it has one proton and carbon has atomic number six, so it has six protons. And the number of protons will identify the atom. So like every atom that has two protons is always going to be helium. And if an atom has 29 protons, it is always going to be copper. The electrons can be different, the neutrons can be different, but the protons identify the atom. So like here, if you have something with, you know, six protons, that's always going to be carbon. It can't be anything else. If you have something with one proton, it's always going to be hydrogen. Can't be anything else. So the number of protons identifies the atom. That's important. So go ahead, find your chapter four lecture worksheet and complete problems nine and ten. Okay, how about the other subatomic particles? So in an atom, the protons must equal the electrons. So an atom is neutral. So if we have a certain number of positive charge, then we have to have that same number of negative charges so that they will be equal. 
So for example, if we have 20 protons in an atom, then you have to have 20 electrons there to balance them out. So the protons and the electrons are going to be equal for these neutral atoms. The neutrons there, um, they have no charge. So they don't have to equal anything. They kind of do their own thing. They don't have to equal the number of protons or electrons. Um, we'll find them out a different way. So one thing that we need to look at is the mass number. We've talked about the atomic mass, and if you'll look at the atomic mass on the periodic table, um, you'll notice that it's not a whole number. So like if we look at carbon, carbon has um, a mass of 12.011, and we'll talk about um, why this is in a minute, but that is not a whole number. So this is the atomic mass, okay? When we talk about mass number, we're going to round the atomic mass to the nearest whole number. So the mass number tells us the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So carbon, its atomic mass is 12.011, but carbon's mass number, right, we would round this, that would be 12. And so that number tells us the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So 12 would be equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. We're going to treat protons and neutrons both like they have a mass of 1, like I was talking about earlier. Um, and so again, carbon has a mass of 12. We know that it has 6 protons, right? Because carbon is atomic number 6. If you look at you know the periodic table, there's a six above carbon. So since it has six protons, right, and we know 12 has to equal protons plus neutrons, we can actually make ourselves a little equation, right? So we could have 12 is equal to, right, we have six protons plus neutrons. If we subtract six from both sides, we'll get that we have six neutrons. Okay, because our mass number equals protons plus neutrons. So we have a little equation here. Our mass number equals protons plus neutrons. And again, remember, electrons are so small that we consider their mass zero for the calculations. So even though that, you know, the, the mass of the electron is contributing a little to that mass, um, it's not enough that it would make a difference. Again, remember, think hairs on your head. So let's determine the number of protons and neutrons. So if we have lithium, for example, lithium, if you look at the periodic table, lithium's atomic mass is 6.94, right? And that would be the atomic mass, but we don't want um, the atomic mass. We want the mass number. So we'll round that to a whole number. So lithium's mass number is seven. And if you look at lithium, it's atomic number three. So remember that atomic number tells us the number of protons. So we have three protons. And if we have, you know, if protons plus neutrons, right, seven is going to equal protons plus neutrons. And so seven is going to equal three plus the number of neutrons. So therefore we have four neutrons. Let's try another one, neon. If you look at neon, neon has an atomic mass of 20.180, um, and its atomic number is 10. Okay, so we'll round that to the nearest whole number. So that gives us 20, and again, our atomic number is 10. So that atomic number tells us that we have 10 protons, which means that the other 10 to get us to 20 must be neutrons. So we have 10 protons and 10 neutrons. So again, sometimes the neutrons will be equal to the number of protons, um, but like in the case of lithium, it doesn't have to be. Neutrons can do their own thing. So we're always going to solve for neutrons is going to be the mass number minus the number of protons, or you can think the mass number minus the atomic number. Okay, so what about the electrons? So like we said, electrons have to be equal to the number of protons because the negatives and the positives have to cancel out. Okay, so our number of electrons is equal to our number of protons, which is really the atomic number. So helium has a mass number of four, an atomic number of two. So since it has an atomic number of two, we know it has two protons. 
And we know 4 minus 2, right, the mass minus the atomic number, that gets us two neutrons. And since the positives and the negatives have to be equal, if we have two positively charged protons, we have to have two negatively charged electrons. So let's try another example, chlorine. Chlorine has a mass number of 35 and an atomic number of 17. So what I want you to do is pause real quick and try to figure out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in chlorine. Okay, so since chlorine has an atomic number of 17, it will have 17 protons. And since it has 17 protons, it must have 17 electrons because the positives and the negatives always have to cancel out. But what about the neutrons? So the neutrons are going to be 35 minus 17, and that will get us 18 neutrons. So there are 17 protons and 17 electrons and 18 neutrons. Go ahead and try another one. Pause here and figure out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in potassium. Okay, so it, since it has atomic number 19, that tells us we have 19 protons. And since protons and electrons have to be equal, if we have protein, you know, 19 protons, we also have 19 electrons. Our positives and negatives have to cancel out. And then again, we're always going to do our mass number minus our atomic number to get our number of neutrons. So 39 minus 19 gets us 20 neutrons. So go ahead and find your chapter uh, four lecture worksheet and complete problems 11 through 13. And um, number 13 is that big, huge table, which will get you some practice on using or on figuring out the number of protons, neutrons, electrons, mass number, and atomic number given varying pieces of information. So make sure you have your periodic table handy when you're doing that. You'll notice um, sometimes the mass number may be different from what you're seeing on the periodic table, and that is because there are different isotopes of an element. Um, but we will talk more about those in the next uh, lecture. But just if you see that the mass isn't quite the same as the mass on the periodic table, that's what's happening. It's the mass of a different isotope.